Okay, so our next presentation is uh, provided by Dr. Albert Colbreth at the University of Georgia. And Albert received his uh, BS and master's from, the, from Auburn University, PhD at, um, at NC State University with a major in plant pathology and a minor in plant breeding. And one thing that Albert does at UGA um, that is um, certainly recognized around the world is his work with tomato spotted wilt virus and also his work with um, leaf spot management and a uh, lot. So he's, his plate is very full. Um, but what we've asked Albert to do today is uh, talk to us about, um, to give us a brief history of tomato spotted wilt virus in peanuts. So thanks for being here, Albert. And um, we'll let you get going. Thank you. I, I certainly appreciate the invitation. Really enjoyed that uh, first pres presentation. See if I can um, share my screen and, and visit Tomato Spotted Will. Yep, you've got it shared. If you can put it in presentation mode, I think we'll be okay. Okay. How's that? Uh, that look that looks good. Right. Well, again, I, I appreciate the invitation, the opportunity to talk about this. It's it's been a, a lo um, long battle with tomato spotted wilt virus with me, uh, so I'm, I'm always. Um, thrilled to get the opportunity to, to talk about it. Tomato spotted wilt virus is, is one of several tospoviruses that, that uh, uh, infect peanut in the Western hemisphere, especially it's the biggest and baddest in terms of the problems caused by it. Um, um, one thing of, of note, especially in, in relation to the, the current human pandemic, uh, tomato spotted wilt virus is um, as we understand it, is primarily an animal virus. It's very, it's in the um, Bungeviridae, um, closely related to some of the, the human pathogens that cause the, uh, the hantaviruses and such. It's in the Tospovirus uh, group, but it's, it's primarily a, a, an animal virus from a um, co-evolutionary standpoint. Now, we think that may be part of the reason it has such a wide host range in the in the, the plant kingdom. Um, tomato spotted wilt viruses uh, spread by thrips. We'll talk more about about those uh, later. But again, that uh, we think a lot most of the coevolution is is with with the um, the insects and and the virus, and not so much the the plants and the virus. Um, especially in peanut, but across an awful lot of other plants, the symptomology of, of uh, tomato spotted wilt is, is absolutely striking. It's a very photogenic disease. This shows uh, the, some of the typical ring spots. Uh, this is, I call, instead of just concentric ring spots, eccentric ring spots, this um, photograph made the cover of essential plant pathology text first edition. So that's, that's so uh, it's quite striking. We see a, a wide variety of, of symptoms. This oak leaf pattern is, is one of those. In addition to the, the foliar symptoms, it causes severe stunting. That is associated with uh, a lot of the yield reduction in, in peanut. What we've seen is that the earlier uh, in the season of a peanut shows symptoms uh, peanut plant shows symptoms to tomato spotted wilt, the, the, the greater the effect. Uh, to, um, this was a study we did back in the early 1990s in, in Tipton, but the, just shows just how dramatically um, tomato spotted wilt can affect a peanut plant. There's a potential for 100% um, yield loss in an individual plant and uh, in severe cases, a potential for 100% yield loss within an individual field. This just shows a, um, the, the chlorosis um, symptom as well as the severe stunning. This was on Stunolaic 97R, which is a very susceptible variety released in 1997, uh, in striking contrast to one of the most resistant breeding lines that, that we have available now. So again, with that severe stunning and chlorosis um, in our, uh, a lot of our 
severe years in the mid 1990s, um, entire fields were not much better than, than what we see in this plot. So just an indication of just how bad that virus can, can affect um, the peanut plant. Um, tomato spotted wilt virus it, itself, of course, named for the tomato, which was described on uh, as a, the initial host and the spotting and the wilting that it caused so responsible for the name. What was um, re, uh, re reported on, on tomato in 1915. So in the overall scheme of things, really not that long ago. Uh, it's first reported on peanut in Brazil in 1941. Uh, it caused some problems there, but never really got to the, to the problems that we we've saw once we got it to the, into the US. Uh, uh, more problems in South Africa in the late 1940s, but again, nothing like what we've um, experienced in, in the US. Uh, it was reported in India in 1968, um, I give this asterisk because what, what they had problems with there is actually uh, now considered a, a different tospovirus, peanut bud necrosis virus. Uh, and there it does uh, wreak havoc with, with peanut production and has for some time. We learned a lot from what was going on uh, in the bud necrosis epidemic, the bud necrosis experience that they had there. Uh, so that, that helped us in terms of formulating our response to spotted wilt once it showed up here. In the US, and, and I'll, I'll talk about the, just the observation on Farik tobacco in Louisiana. It was reported in 1973, but Dr. Lowell Black said he had observed it as, as early as 1968 and reported that his growers had talked about seeing that same symptom in tobacco for quite a few years before that. So it was evident that it was in Louisiana as far as uh, occurrence on, uh, in peanut. It was re reported in Colorado, uh, Colorado County, Texas in 1971 and Waller County, Texas in 1972. Didn't do much damage there. Typically reported just around the edges of the, the peanut fields. There was um, additional uh, incidents reported in 1984, but in 1985 in Frio and Atascosa counties in, in uh, southern Texas, um, severe epidemics were reported with a, 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 on the average of about 50% incidents with some fields 100% loss in 1985, 1986. Uh, Mark Black uh, was um, my pathological brother. He was also a graduate of NC State uh, working under Dr. Butte. So I was in close communication with him because I was working on tomato spotted wilt virus. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I was working on cylindricladium black rot in North Carolina. And from his reports, I was concerned that I would have to deal with that and figure out what was what because some of the, the yellowing symptoms of spotted wilt is similar to what we, what we saw with um, um, cylinder cladium black rot. So, um, but severe problems in Texas in 85 and 86. Um, there seemed to be a, a westward movement uh, in 1983. There was severe losses. Well, spotted what was observed in Mississippi in, in 1983 with severe losses there in 1986. There was not. Um, extensive peanut production in, in Mississippi uh, at, at that time. This is uh, up in the northwest of Mississippi, but it, it uh, really wreaked havoc, I think, primarily on, on Spanish peanuts in production there. But again, representing a, um, a general westward movement of, of, or at least westward detection of uh, spotted wilt and peanut. As far as Related to, to Georgia and in the timeline for tomato spotted wilt, again, it was identified in South Texas in 1971. Uh, Western flower thrips was found in Georgia for the first time in, in uh, 1980. Uh, there was no smoking gun to indicate that, that uh, the virus came with Western flower thrips, uh, but with a, 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 a thrips with the name Western, it should have been in California uh, and, and such, but uh, it ended up in Georgia. And then not too long after that, um, the occurrence of, of um, spotted wilt was, was noted. So that we think that 
we, we don't have proof, but we suspect that that was involved with the introduction of, of um, spotted wilt into the southeastern United States. Uh, again, spotted wilt was identified in Mississippi in 1983, 50% losses in South Texas in 1985, severe losses in Mississippi in 1986. In that same year, spotted wilt was identified in Alabama and Georgia. And in a lot of cases, it was more of a gee whiz. Uh, that that's, looks like spotted wilt. And, uh, but um, um, un unfortunately, it was, it was just the start of something much, much bigger. I came to Georgia in 1989. I, I have actually um, been accused of bringing the virus with me. It did beat me here by a little bit. Um, but uh, it got here about the same time I did and then emerged as a problem. And the first losses were noted in Georgia in 1990. And after that, it was um, hold on. It was quite a rough ride for the next few years with that. Just looking at the, the increase in losses over time from, from the first losses noted in 1990 uh, up through um, 1997, uh, an almost linear increase, a substantial increase in um, each of those years uh, to the point that in 1997, we lost over 12% of our crop, which at that time was, was worth over $40 million. Uh, I do believe that had the, the increase continued at the same rate, we would not have been um, able to continue peanut production in, in Georgia. It was just that big of a factor. Um, and uh, it was scary to think about what, what could have happened uh, had that occurred. So why did that happen? Um, I asked our students in introductory plant pathology every year to be able to give me a recipe for a severe epidemic. And our re recipe in the Southeastern United States, especially Georgia, for a severe epidemic was there in the late 1980s we had a near monoculture of 750,000 plus acres of what we found out was a very TSWV susceptible cultivar flow runner. Uh, most of the other varieties that were grown on a smaller scale were equally uh, susceptible. We had the introduction of a, of a new pathogen, uh, TSWV. Um, has a wide host range, which, which gave it all sorts of opportunity for um, uh, overwintering, surviving, such. We had the Western flower thrips that was new to the area, um, which, which is a, a very capable vector. We think that is involved in, in the overwintering, at, but we also had the tobacco thrips, which had been a long time um, problem with um, uh, in peanuts and, and cotton in the, in the Southeast United States. So all of those factors came together. We had a, a, a really good recipe for an epidemic just with that. But in addition, um, much of our crop in Alabama, Florida, and Georgia at the time was planted in April, some uh, as early as March. And what we found out uh, was that the planting date was a, was a very important factor with, with tomato swatted wilt virus epidemics. Um, the, the, with the earlier planting uh, being much more severe, we also learned that seeding rates and final populations were um, critical. And, and the, with the higher the population, the less impact the virus had. Uh, but at the time, and it was based on research that showed we could do it, we were using lower seeding rates and establishing um, um, smaller populations. But that was playing into the hands of, of, of tomato spotted will. In addition, um, like we, we see with a lot of epidemics in across kingdoms, uh, there was some denial. In the 1990, 1970s, peanut model virus was found in the southeastern United States. That was, was uh, reported and, and uh, pathologists, virologists were gearing up for a, a major problem with that. It didn't uh, materialize as anything close to the, the um, um, problem that some of the other diseases were. And then the same thing in 1982, peanut stripe virus was detected in Georgia. Um, those are both um, aphid, aphid 
transmitted viruses and really never um, did a lot of damage across the peanut belt. So when spotted wilt showed up, there were people that, that saw it and just and, and thought it was just another just another virus and won't likely amount to anything. There was some indication that, that people thought we were, were well, had been crying wolf, and this was just another uh, of those. We we soon uh, learned that was certainly not the case. We had the tobacco thrips here. It was a it was a very competent vector of of um, tomato spotted wilt. It was a long term long time pest in uh, peanut in uh, tobacco cotton and. Uh, peanut in Georgia. It reproduces extremely well on peanut and, and cotton as an absolute thrips factory. So it's also active in most of the year in Georgia. So we, we had an um, uh, opportunity for a much uh, greater spread factor with, with regard to spotted wilt uh, in peanut. It has to pick up the virus as, a, as a, uh, an immature, but then can spread it throughout its uh, entire adult life. This is the feeding injury that, that caused by the tobacco thrips, not really a factor in, in, the, in the spotted wilt. The Western flower thrips, also a very competent vector. It was not known in Georgia before 1980. Uh, it, uh, again, as I mentioned, it was a, a, a strong coincidence that the timing of detection of Western flower thrips and the emergence of TSWV uh, as a problem. It's active anytime uh, blooms are present on a wide range of, of plants in, in Georgia. It does not reproduce well on, on peanut at all. Again, it's mostly in the flowers. Uh, peanut flowers don't last long enough for the uh, Western flower tips to reproduce, even if it's um, laying its eggs there. But we've got competent vectors. Uh, also, the peanut year in Georgia is a relatively long crop. Uh, going from April, sometimes even earlier, all the way through November. So we've got a, a susceptible crop in the, in the field. In addition to that, we have volunteer peanuts uh, present for at least another month on, the, on, the, on each end of the season. Uh, so there's not a lot of time without peanut presence, peanut plants present. So that's um, um, pretty much a, a year round if you throw in the, the wide host range and the potential for the virus and the thrips uh, to colonize weeds in the area as well. Uh, and then the peak populations of, of the Western flower thrips typically um, about the time we were, we were um, planting a, a lot of our peanut crops. So um, that's involved what we think with, with the effects of, of um, planting date on um, incidents of the virus. So what did we do? Um, this is something I'm, I've been very proud to be, be a part of. Uh, I believe the response to tomato spotted wilt and, and peanut in the, in the southeastern United States is one of the best examples of a team approach to a complicated and, and challenging problem that I know of in, in all of, of plant pathology, um, dealing with the thrips, um, a new virus, one that um, I think very much was a threat to, to put us out of the peanut business. Uh, this is a, a very abbreviated list of the, the people that, that were involved with the, those in, initial projects that uh, addressed the, the issue of spotted wilt, tackle that problem uh, across all disciplines. It was not just a pathology problem, not just a virology problem, not just an entomology problem. It was, a, it was a peanut problem when uh, a lot of integrated work, a lot of people working together that would not uh, have worked together otherwise. One of the key things was the, um, uh, trying to come up with a resistance of some sort. Again, we hadn't had the virus. It was, it was not part of the, the breeding objectives. And, but lo and behold, um, um, Southern Runner, which had been released in, in uh, uh, Florida in 1986, was found to have some apparent resistance to, to tomato spotted wilt. This was observed in Texas. We confirmed that in, in Georgia. Um, spotted wilt was, was, was it, well, Southern Runner was certainly not immune to spotted wilt, but was much better 
than Flow Runner, which was our standard resistant variety for the longest time there. It was released in 1986 as the least pot resistant cultivar PI203396, we think was the source of the, the spotted wilt resistance. But again, it was not selected for spotted wilt resistance, um, whether that's uh, serendipity, uh, just blind luck or divine intervention. Um, I don't know, but we had that available. Spotted wilt uh, or Southern Runner was never accepted uh, as a cultivar for production on a, on a large scale, but it ended up being an excellent parent. It was a parent to Georgia Green, uh, which was a developed from, by Dr. Bill Branch as a cross with Southern Runner by Cell Belt, Sun Belt Runner. Sun Belt Runner was an, another uh, very susceptible variety, uh, but Georgia Green then became the predominant cultivar in the southeastern United States. Again, the resistance in Georgia Green similar to that in, in Southern Runner, but was much more acceptable for, for uh, production on a, on a large scale in the Southeastern United States. Um, so the Georgia Green had a moderate level of resistance, field resistance to uh, spotted wilt, but it responded to all sorts of factors that helped suppress uh, the spotted wilt epidemics. Moving the planting date to mid-May helped. Increasing the plant population helped. The use of 4-8 insecticide at, at planting helped. The move to twin row patterns instead of the single row patterns helped suppress the virus. Use of strip tillage helped. None of these factors alone were anywhere close to enough to, to provide the, the degree, of, degree of control we needed for, the, for the, the problem. But you put those together with the moderate level of, of resistance in Georgia Green, um, and it, it was able to um, helped greatly with the, the management of that. Steve Brown uh, was the extension entomologist at the time. He um, developed the concept of a method of risk assessment using all of those factors. Uh, and, and we came up with the, the risk assessment index, which was an um, a excellent grower tool that, that let the growers um, make decisions on, on how to put together all of those. That risk assessment index is now part of our, our peanut RX. And that um, integrated approach to, to spotted wilt management um, had a huge impact. And as noted by the great decrease in instance, uh, percent loss and, and uh, dollar losses after that peak in 1997. Again, uh, shortly after Georgia Green was released, uh, we had the first spotted wilt index released. Uh, we had dramatic changes in the cultivar planted and the, the time of our planting, planting later in the season. By uh, 1989, we were over 95% of a variety with a moderate level of resistance. Uh, and by the 1st of May, we, we were uh, less than 2% of our crop planted before May 1st. So we've had a huge impact on uh, the losses to spotted wilt. Again, it was a team approach and integrated approach in terms of management, um, uh, extremely successful. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention is, as well though, is the, the impact of the spotted wilt epidemic on uh, some of the sociological aspects. It, it, there was actually a novel written that was initially titled Vector by Thrips, which dealt um, strongly with um, a crazy plant pathologist who worked on um, tomato spotted wilt. The, the editors didn't like that. The Vector by Thrips was a scary title, so they moved it to quite a year of thumb, quite a year for plums. Um, the other thing that, that spotted wilt did that I'm not aware of any other disease having done is it predicted the outcome of the 2004 presidential election in the United States. Um, um, that just happened. I don't, I don't think it was the cause of it, but it predicted it. After Georgia Green, we, we knew we needed um, better varieties in um, UGA, USDA, University of Florida, um, private breeders, North Carolina, um, all 
Of course, by that time, Spotted Wilt was a, a, a key factor for their selections. Uh, by, not, by 2006 and 2007, there were several varieties released with considerably better field resistance than, than we had in Georgia Green. This was a response to um, 4-8 insecticide. And with a lot of those, uh, at least in that year, not it wasn't needed nearly as much, but available there. But again, um, major steps in breeding for better and better resistance to tomato spotted wilt. Um, breeding efforts can continue even better than, than the, the uh, resistance in varieties like Georgia 06G and Tifgard. Georganic was a red seeded variety, so never, never was uh, uh, used for production. Uh, but it, it showed us we could have um, even better levels of resistance. And the, the breeding line 94022, not acceptable for peanut production, but uh, uh, shows us we do have potential for better resistance. So made progress on that end. Georgia 12Y was actually, uh, actually had um, Jorganic as one of the parents. So uh, again, this is the best that we have in terms of re released varieties right now. Uh, huge difference from, from Flow Runner and the susceptible Sunolake 90, 97R in years past. So, and again, this is the 94022, uh, again, being used in mapping studies. And I think that's um, not so much the, for the history of spotted wilt, but I think this is the future. I think we have um, great potential to. Um, increase the resistance that we have, um, not just from hypogeal, but also from some of the, um, the wild species. So I, I think we really have just scratched the surface of what we can do with, with field resistance to that. So in conclusion, um, integrated management system has been very successful in reducing and preventing losses of spotted wilt. Uh, interdisciplinary university, agency, state, company, country, Enter everything teamwork has, has been the key. And again, I'm, I've been, it's been um, really good to be involved with that. Um, so the tomato spider wilt problem has been solved. We can take our boughs and rest on our laurels. Uh, but then we get phone calls. Uh, the spotted wilt hasn't gone away. And in, uh, in 2019, 2020, uh, it's on the upswing. Um, greater percent losses and with the acreage and value of the crop, uh, dollar losses even higher than ever. So um, we've made a lot of progress, um, but I'm reminded of a Navajo proverb, that coyote is always out there waiting and coyote is always hungry. And I think we need to say the same thing for, for TSWV. We've come a long ways, but we still have a ways to go. So with that, I thank you. If you have other questions, um, feel free to contact me at spotwilt at uga.edu. And I appreciate the photography by, Dr. by Mr. Simon McCallan. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, Albert, for a, a great presentation and an overview of history. We've got time for, for one or two questions and I'm gonna read one question that came from Barry Tillman. This might be the only one we have time for. So great history lesson on TSWV and peanut. It seems like this disease is problemat problematic only in the US, even though reported sporadically around the world. Do you have any ideas as to why it is more severe in the USA versus other areas? Um, basically just a, a, a swag in terms of the ideas. I, I think the, the uh, key thing for the Southeastern United States is the the um, interaction with the, the, the crops, multiple crops, multiple weeds with the thrip species that we have. And, and uh, I think the combination of the introduction of Western flower thrips, which has a, a wide host range in itself, doesn't seem to do that much on, on peanut, but I think that's a, it's a key part of the, the, the virus um, cycle uh, in the Southeastern US. And then to have a, a species like the, the tobacco thrips, uh, which just so many numbers, so many generations, not just on peanut, again, spotted wilt is not really a problem on cotton, but 
but cotton is a thrips factory for, for um, something like a tobacco thrips. So I think to me that that combination of the interaction of the, uh, the diversity of hosts and, and also the thrip species, I think is the, the reason it took off um, so strongly and has maintained itself so strongly in the Southeast um, compared to um, other parts of the world where it, it occurs from time to time on peanut, but, uh, and does do severe damage from time to time as these several of the other um, tospel viruses. But uh, I think uh, they don't have the, the um, I guess the, the um, that looming thrips population that we do, so. Thanks, Albert. Thanks for that. That's a that was a great answer and, and one I've thought about as well. And I think um, in interest of time, we're going to move on to our next speaker again. Thanks, Albert, for all you've done with Spotted Weld and for your presentation today. Thank you.